Right. Hello, everybody. Hello um, out there to uh, Barcelona. We have a guest from Barcelona today, uh, and welcome to Barbara, who will be introduced shortly. Um, we're very jealous that you will you, <laughs> that you sit in beautiful Barcelona. Um, Innsbruck is not too shabby today, but. Um, we uh, the winter is here now so we are now in a completely different uh, different time zone it feels like it um welcome to all of you on your screens uh, from wherever you are um i'm just gonna say a few words on last week last week we had two colleagues here from Innsbruck University who talked about their project uh, chill the base uh, which was concerned with the the needs and issues non-traditional students have at Austrian or Tyrolean universities or institutions of higher education. Um, we talked about non-traditional, what it means to be a sort of non-traditional student, which is a certain terminology, which is more open than uh, sort of um, naming one analytical category of difference. So it's not uh, um, sort of uh, focused on a specific category of difference, but it kind of em embraces a broader approach. Of course, the question is, who is a traditional student? And uh, then we get right into the uh, very tricky uh, um, matter of visibility of differences. What last week played a huge role was uh, family background, the academic uh, family background, who, what did parents and grandparents do of, uh, of the students that we have here, um, and how, high, how likely is it to, that you join a university when neither your parents, nor, nor your mother and father, or your grandparents actually had an academic education. Um, what I found very interesting last week is that um, you know we look at uh, institutions of higher education, but of course uh, differences start earlier, and uh, we actually went all the way back to kindergarten, where education starts and where sort of students learn how to make a difference in a way. Um, Today we have um, a little bit of a different uh, approach. We, uh, Barbara will talk to us about uh, feminist intersectionality. Um, you remember the concept of intersectionality from our first session. We talked about um, the different uh, the, the, the different axes of um, uh, um, um, of diversity. We talked about inequality um, and. Um, Barbara will introduce a new top, a new aspect to us today, sexual and gender related violence, and I'm very uh, excited to see what she's going to uh, cover under this, uh, uh, under this uh, approach. And um, maybe we can then in the Q&A also talk a little bit about intersectionality, about uh, how you, uh, how you uh, tackle this, uh, this angle from a feminist uh, point of view and how we can link it back to the first session. I will now hand over to Dirk who will introduce Barbara for us. Thank you, Silke, and welcome also from uh, my side. And uh, it's great to have you here, Barbara, um, in our um, online lunch seminar. Um, Barbara, Barbara Bilia um, comes to us from today, as we heard from uh, Barcelona, um, where she also received her PhD in 2006 in psychology. And she is uh, currently an uh, associate professor in the Department of Pedagogy at the Rovira e Virgili University, which is our partner university in the Aurora Network in Tarragona, only an hour away from uh, Barcelona. Uh, Barbara researches um, different topics uh, from the perspective of gender and uh, feminism, um, topics like processes of knowledge production and feminist epistemology, uh, gender-based violence, sociological analysis of public policies, um, and so on. She is a uh, founder and an active member of different uh, research networks in the area of uh, interdisciplinary uh, feminist uh, research um, and uh, also intercultural um, uh, education. Um, and she has been the Catalan coordinator of the EU um, GEP work and USV REACT project and is um, uh, also currently an um, investigator in these uh, project settings. Um, she also works on visualizing and measuring the problems of sexual and gender violence in universities. And this brings us, of course, to our 
uh, topic uh, today back to issues of higher education and diversity. You can already see uh, the title of her talk here, the need for a feminist intersectional approach to tackle sexual and gender related violence within higher education institutions. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara, for joining us here in our lecture series and uh, and bringing in your perspective on this um, uh, topic. And with this, I hand over the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk and Silke, for this uh, invitation and for organizing this uh, course or series of lecture that is uh, extremely interesting and is a very great opportunity of interchange between uh, different contexts. And uh, please, uh, uh, thank you very much also to everybody that is uh, out there in the network. And I don't know who is and where you are, but uh, I hope you you have some insight from uh, the the talk, and uh, it creates some curiosity, and you want to uh, reflect a little bit more. So I will be really, really happy of any question, criticism, comments, uh, whatever you think uh, it can be interesting to to share with us. So please don't don't stop. And uh, if there is something uh, that my English is not completely understandable, please also let me know that I may sometime uh, invent some word or, or whatever. Okay. So let's start as uh, Dirk was say. I like to. Well, this is my little uh, index of what I'm going to present shortly and i would like to start with uh, talking about roots and contextualization because uh, uh, i'm particularly uh, um, i'm a very situated i'm in the paradigm of the situated knowledge so i think that we have to know where we start from so it's not just a question of studying on gender but i think i i i, I am a feminist and i have been a feminist uh, since uh, many years ago or much before i became an academic worker that i'm so, i don't feel also an academics but a, a worker in the academia so in 2005 with a uh, in 2005 with a friend for example we wrote this uh, uh, this book a Saddle the wonder but a state of wonder uh, to talk about gender related violence and to talk about how does uh, uh, they couldn't, they are not individual better, but uh, they are related uh, with uh, our society, with our structure of the, within the society and whatever. So that was uh, a first step in working in this area. And I, I start with the gap work in European project on uh, educating uh, uh, educator on uh, uh, how to prevent and detect gender-related violence. A problem is that normally uh, the focus is, uh, normally not, but frequently the focus is on uh, young people, like if educator was already well aware of uh, the problem and were able to correct it, and we believe that is not just so true. That is a problem of adultism we normally have, so we wanted to work with uh, with adults, and especially with teachers. And in the US VREAT, we also do a similar work uh, with the uh, teacher and uh, administrative people within the university. Uh, now we are in this last uh, last project uh, where I'm uh, last uh, at the moment actual project uh, that is Sagar uh, Rooney. Um, and uh, uh, in this this is more national ones and but we work mostly on visibilizing and also nuancing with from from a feminist uh, intersectional perspective what does we mean with uh, gender and sexual related violence so uh, okay uh, one of the things that we are doing uh, in this project is trying to uh, construct a survey uh, from uh, um the experience of uh, uh, people that is uh, living uh, uh, gender related violence within the university in this sense we are doing a lot of groups with uh, different uh, people and we especially are interested in a collective or group that have been less studied in this sense uh, so, for example, racialized people, and um, dissident, sexual dissident people, but also people with uh, um, 
diagnosis of uh, psychological diagnosis of psychiatric diagnosis, uh, survivor of sexual oriented violence, uh, and the different able people, and the finalist, a group that is generally not very uh, studied, that is people that work in a university as subcontractor. So, for example, the cleaning lady or the people that work in the cafeteria. Uh, actually, we had some problem at this point with this because we started our research just when the pandemic started. <laughs> so, uh, it, without the groups, it was easier to maintain the, the, the research uh, online, but with the um, subcontracted people, it was more, much more difficult to have contact. So, we still have uh, uh, something to do in this sense. So, uh, to go in what we understand with sexually generated violence, uh, um, we want to, to remember that we are not focusing on the subject that is exercising the violence, but uh, on uh, how does this violence is genderized. Okay? So, uh, it is a question of uh, how gender power intervene in within the violence and that's uh, that's very important for us so in this sense it is not just women that suffer gender related violence but then as we see we will see later is need a means that everybody will suffer violence in the same way i i included here some uh, some picture have, like, for example, obviously the heteropatriarchal uh, family, and uh, that is uh, one of the stru social structures that uh, more important for the production of the gender-related violence. But also a picture of uh, Billy Elliot on stereotypes, uh, even on on children, on male children, and the sexualization, for example, and ethnicization of uh, the body of uh, black women, for example. Uh, so. We, we, we slightly move the attention from the subject. Uh, ooh, I, I, I make interview, uh, but okay, <laughs> I, I wrote incorrectly. From the subject that received or produced the violence to the structure of oppression. So in this sense, it will link a lot with the first section I have heard, you have already been done, I read it. I, I, I do my homework and I, I was following you. So, um, also, another important thing is that we want, when we talk about sexual violence, we have to remember that it's much more than rape. Uh, it's not just a, a penal uh, penetration uh, from, uh, a, but but it, but there is much more elements and haven't that are sexual violence and that they are quite common and. Uh, when we focus just on the more explicit or more bigger one, we lose the big picture, but also uh, we are not able to prevent that uh, bigger uh, experience uh, um, can be detected and uh, solved, okay? So, uh, here is the things, uh, as you were already talking about the intersectionality, I'm not going to enter in deeper on it, but uh, it is really important to remember for who was not at your section that uh, the word intersectionality was uh, firstly used by black feminists uh, to point out the discrimination that is not just a double discrimination, but a specific discrimination that women of color uh, will receive and to see that uh, um, people uh, do not have just a, one, do not lie just uh, under one structure of oppression, but by different one, and they, they intersect particularly. In this sense, uh, one of the problem of the use intersectionality nowadays is that it's becoming a, a very common word, and uh, it even seems more uh, nice than uh, feminism because it seems that everybody is intersectional and obviously everybody's intersectional but most of us are in a position of privilege so it didn't mean that is all the same so uh, we aim to recognize uh, to use a feminist perspective intersectional perspective to understand gender-related violence but this didn't mean 
that the subject that received this violence are still mostly women, children of every gender, and transsexual people, and uh, not uh, heteronormative people. So, uh, and at the same time, people that mostly exercise this violence as are just men. And we have to recognize this. This didn't imply that the women cannot exercise gender-related violence, but it implied that in a, um, normally in a gener in a relation, for example, in a partner relation, uh, in a heterosexual partner relation, if a woman exercises violence, it is not gender-related violence because it's not because there's a woman or a man, but it, because of the structure of power. But yes, a woman, for example, can exercise power when you say to children, don't cry, otherwise you are a girl. Okay, that's sexual and gender related violence. Okay. So um, basically, we want to understand the gender related violence in an expression of uh, lack of power. And uh, also, uh, it brings a form of govern to women and other not normative. Uh, gender and sexual preference not normative subjects okay i like very much this uh, this picture uh, because it 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 represents for me a lot of what does what happened with gender related violence if you don't uh, if you you didn't need to exercise your power over other if you really believe that you have it uh, so this is this is a trick problem that uh, we will have to solve in our work <laughs> so talking about uh, entering in di directly in um, in uh, what happened within the university uh, sometimes it seems that uh, gender violence is a new phenomenon but actually it is an elephant in the room already in the 17th of last century <laughs> there was a, a group of uh, feminists uh, for example in berkeley university organizing against uh, sexual harassment within university and in 19 in the USA's, uh, some statistics, some start to be displayed on uh, what happened within the campus. Okay. Nonetheless, it was uh, uh, in uh, 2030 that uh, coinciding more or less with also with the phenomenon of Me Too and whatever in this, in this same period, okay, that uh, we have more visibility on what's going on. For example, here we have an experience uh, of uh, women that have been raped within the university. She had been uh, recognized and so she was doing a um, performative art action, direct action, going around with her mattress for the uni uh, in the university. Okay. Um, another uh, an element that is still an elephant in the room, especially in the North Country, uh, where um, gender-related violence within the university are more recognized, more acknowledged, is that what is acknowledged is normally the, the ra rape or sexual violence that occurs between students. And uh, uh, sexual violence from professor to students or gender violence from professors to students uh, or between pro professor, between administrative people and uh, between them is mass less recognized and tackled. So we believe it's a big problem uh, because exactly if we, if we recognize that power is uh, is one of the reason because this this happened and this violence is much uh, less recognized but also much more difficult to denounce and to act against it so uh it, if we talk about this uh, this uh, hidden experience uh, we have also to recognize that uh, uh many what we know, what we are able to know about what happened, are just a very, very slightly portion of what is going, what is going on. In our research, in our interview, we, for example, uh, um, receive a response from uh, some survey provider uh, of a survivor service provider, and they mention how difficult it is for uh, racialized people or, or um, differently able people to 
make uh, a, a public denunciation. So basically, there is, at least here in Catalonia, there is no uh, evidence of the sexual or gender related violence suffered by people, racialized people, or disabled people, different functionally people. I, sorry, it's, it's difficult to say for me. <laughs> uh, in the university. That is always something that is hidden. And also, if uh, we look at research, we can find that, uh, for example, in the uh, United States, uh, the research show that uh, a lot of LGBTQ plus people um, uh, within the university, they use a strategy called a strategic closet. Uh, so not to uh, show their uh, preference, their sexual preference, in order not to suffer violence, okay? That is in itself a violence. If you cannot show your preference, is in itself a violence. Other experience uh, uh, we have recollected about uh, the ex intersectionality experience of gender-related violence, uh, is uh, that, uh, for example, uh, there is no any sensibility about uh, functional and cognitive diversity in the university. So it's quite common to have uh, offensive or violent comments uh, against uh, cognitive functional diverse people. Among peers, in this sense, students, because the person was thought he was a student, but also from professors. So this is also uh, why does we allow this to happen is not a violence and how it is uh, become also a gender violence when the the, the kind of uh, uh, joke, for example, that are played are genderized. Okay, at the same time, Muslim uh, girls, for example, express how does uh, the discrimination they receive because they look, they bring a scarf is extremely different from the one that male uh, uh, students receive. Same happened with uh, we here in Spain. We have a lot of uh, Latino uh, Latin American uh, professors, students, and whatever. And the same happened uh, with uh, with them. For example, when they is assumed that a Latin girl, a Latin woman, cannot be a professor, but she should be the secretary. Okay, this is something very common, and. Uh, one group we didn't uh, analyze in depth, but I think it's it will be also interesting to talk about is uh, Erasmus students or international students that they generally receive uh, uh, women generally receive a great amounts of gender related violence, and because they have no network, they cannot defend themselves and they don't know what to do. So basically, uh, we believe that uh, university, we have to recognize that we are not in an ivory tour. Uh, knowledge uh, or level of education is not enough uh, to, in order not to reproduce, to reproduce violence. But also the system within the university is facilitating this violence. Force because there is strong power hierarchy in our university. And it's well recognized between all the studies that uh, uh, within a power relation, within a working environment, uh, gender violence is being stronger. Okay. Secondly, because we have this uh, neoliberal environments that is much focused on uh, effectiveness uh, efficiency in the market that on uh, a really educative process it seems we have to create a good worker for the market instead of uh, um, people with value <laughs> with uh, <laughs> with uh, a human <laughs> experience uh, that is uh, positive both for the university and outside also and and related with the, this power hierarchy is that uh, is a strange at least here in the south is is a strange um 
mix between uh, a feudal system in which uh, in order to have a position you have to be in, uh, uh, serving the, <laughs> the king and uh, a superficial system in which obviously you are we are all a family but we did like it happened within the family the violence is strong the dependency is strong and the gender relation is an issue in a, a name that cross all this relation okay the cooperative defense is another one many universities didn't want to recognize that they it would happen in their in their um space and uh, uh, the bureaucratization it makes uh, very very difficult to denounce within the university to know to whom you have to denounce how and who can help you and then another thing is that obviously the uh, competence of the university uh, against penal act for example uh, are not strong because the, we are educative spaces so it's like okay but if, if you tell this to us, we, we move, we tell you that is not our responsibility. You have to go to the other, uh, for example, for a normal court or judgment and whatever. Okay. And finally, the politically correctness that is uh, typical in the university. Obviously, you can make a very offensive and uh, mm, sexist and violent joke. Uh, in a good way that it seems even uh, nice to people so that people cannot recognize it okay and on the other side is that uh, it seems that uh, we, if we acknowledge publicly and if we, we include in our statement within of the university statement that we are zero tolerance university that's mean that we are zero tolerance and we can use good word to say it and not, so nothing is going on no no it's not me you know so that's that's a very very big problem okay uh, the precarization uh, uh, within the university is another of uh, element of the element that allowed the gender related violence to to be so strong especially talking about uh, um, teaching and administrative staff but also when we talk about students that want to go to make a master to make a phd and then maybe to work within the university so obviously when you are in a precarious status it depends on other and so the the, the violence can be stronger um, and the other things is that uh, um, there is also a uh, equality discourse that uh, is a form of institutional moral violence. We are continuously uh, being told that uh, we have uh, uh, we are not discriminated. That our university are so uh, egalitarian, okay? But at the same time, meritocracy didn't recognize the different. A system of position so the same discourse it become a violence because it is uh, okay i it's not uh, a quality problem is me that i'm not able to be so good has to reach this position so um talking about what does uh, uh, academics uh, are doing uh, in order to respond gender related violence uh, what we find in our work is that there is mainly two kind of approach um, in the anglo-saxon context there is uh, this approach of syphetic and screening that is becoming very very important um, all the university is trying to put more camera in the campus, uh, uh, controlling movements of people and uh, um, creating an atmosphere of uh, fear that uh, uh, is obviously not helping a change of culture around sexual and gender-related violence because 
It's just you don't have to be seen. It's not that you don't have to do it. You don't have to be seen. And we as university, the only things that do is check if something is going on. And so you cannot then put a demand on us. But we are not working to change the culture of violence and, and not generated violence. So this is a very, very big problem. Um, because it's reducing uh, um, again the sexual and generated violence as something that uh, uh, treating it as if it was something that just few persons do because they are bad person, but don't don't acknowledge what the the violence that the same institution are reproducing. The second uh, approach that is mostly uh, in the south is that we are still in denyment, okay? So our university mostly say, woo, 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 okay, we can put a policy, but not done it, let number go out, because otherwise people will believe that we are bad, and that we cannot recognize that we are also, that in our safe space, it's happened this. This is, uh, um, something uh, that um, we see, for example, in the fact that we have some protocols, but uh, uh, there is no visibility on how does the protocol works, uh, uh, how many people have been denouncing, the timing that the denouncers have been uh, uh, working on, and uh, uh, the uh, effect or the results of what happened. Obviously, is also a question that there is very few denouns, so you have to maintain anonymity. But uh, with this excuse, we are also producing a perverse system in which people didn't even know that they have their they right. And probably if we show the number, people will not denounce in the university because if you say, okay, it will take two years to have a result, I have if I am a student, they have already finished my university, is not is not working. Okay. Uh, finally, in uh, some places we have worked quite a lot with uh, some Latin American uh, um, country, and in many of them, uh, they are the process is uh, still in, still uh, going on. They most many of them they don't have a specific policy. Uh, some are introducing this in the last year, especially because there is uh, some uh, uh, a strong student pressure. For example, how is this happening in this last few years in Mexico? Uh, the other things is that uh, uh, policy that uh, we analyzed, they generally uh, dismissing intersectionality. Uh, they don't understand how it uh, it work, and they tend to homogenizing the experience of violence and uh, uh, neglecting the specific experience of vulnerable group. Obviously, um, this is uh, something quite common in the legislation and norm because you have to put a path, you have to describe what have to be done and how things are. And this is really can fit in experience of people. But what is happening is that it's becoming sometimes the, the policy can become a violence in itself, a gender violence in itself. So it's quite a, a crazy sit situation. And in this sense, also there is quite a lot of uh, revictimization because the uh, institutional procedure are not so clear, and because uh, people that uh, women that experience gender related violence have to repeat their story many many times and uh, have to prove that they have been. Uh, aggressive, harassed, uh, uh, or whatever. So um, the focus, uh, and we will see later that is that is particularly problematic, the focus is uh, to understand if it was really something legally uh, persecutable. Is correct the word persecutable? Yeah, it's understandable. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, at the same time, there is uh, um, a tendency of disempowering both the subject and uh, the collective. Um, for example, here in Catalonia, at least, so that we have studied more in deep the, the, the protocol. Uh, in uh, any protocol, there is a reference on... Uh, uh, obviously, we know that it can be, there can be people that make false denouns. Okay, and we have to control that is not. But if you link protocol on other topics, there is never this sentence. So what's happened? False denouns can happen just in the case of gender-related violence? No, obviously not. And in fact, if we study a number uh, in a robber, robbery, for example, false denouns are much, much, much higher than the very little one that happened with sexually generated violence. But introducing this sentence in the protocol, uh, it uh, positioned the university uh, in a not very friendly way in a, a acknowledging of the of the gender related violence. Actually, it reforms gender related violence because it see that is any, anyhow you have to recognize that people, some women are just inventing it. So don't believe her. The, the contrary of what we are doing in uh, in activists that we believe, sister, we believe you. Here has mm, we don't believe you basically, <laughs> okay. Um, and also, uh, when the, some students uh, make some action of stand defense, the, for example, they make some scratch or some uh, they write on the wall or they, or they put card with the name of a teacher that have been harassing them. Generally, they receive a stronger punishment than the harasser itself. So it's it's quite quite crazy. Okay, so what we are suggesting in order to turning the table a little bit, um, we have made a few suggestions, for example, obviously the first of all is a visibili visibilizing, and in this sense we want to mention a campaign that have been uh, uh, organized by the UPF here in Catalonia, uh, that uh, uh, they make very short videos for students um, in order to identify uh, gender-related violence in their context. And they are quite easy, quite uh, well done. And uh, is uh, it, the important thing is, it is not is that they are not putting the focus on the victim. Okay but they are putting the focus on we are all uh, uh, responsible we have to detect it we have to prevent it and you also have to notice that maybe you are exercising some of this violence and is not uh, normal what we are doing the other things is that we need more uh, detailed data in our uh, work we have also a part of the focus group we have analyzed a lot of uh, survey that have been done on uh, on uh, sexual and generated violence in the university and we noticed that uh, most of them uh, don't recognize uh, uh, intersectionality and uh, it's not just that but they use elements and words that um, are related with the the legal the legal uh, aspect of general sexual related violence, and uh, it, many violence are not uh, detected. So we have to create new instruments to detect this violence. The second one is breaking taboo and questioning uh, power. Uh, sexual sex is still a taboo. We don't have education, sexual education within that school and in the university, for example, we still don't have, we have condoms sometimes, but we still don't have, for example, a uh, um, female uh, towel, like if it was something that we still not have to talk about. And so, and there is this, uh, still this, uh, this idea of uh, relation with the uh, sex with the romantic love, this is still going on and is do 
so bad for sexual and gender violence. And also within the university, it's really need a work on how to question power. And I believe that uh, as it's shown in the, in the picture, it had to be done collectively and not just individually. On the other side, we suggest that we have to uh, shift the, fo the focus uh, to the survi survivor needs and acting a politic of cares is not our um, work as university to analyze if legally this per the person that have been uh, uh, violent um, have committed a crime or not but uh, we have to help a person that did that have feel harassed even if legally this will not be considered an harassment so the idea is changing the politics in order to um, improve mechanism of self-support and of support of uh, students and uh, uh, professor and past and administrative that uh, are suffering this this violence. Another thing is that uh, uh, in, uh, in neoliberal systems, uh, much more the responsibility is uh, is being uh, uh, put on uh, on uh, individual on the individual that suffered this violence. Uh, it, this is a way of uh, uh, not acknowledging the uh, collective responsibility. So we have to break down this discourse of resi resilience is you and it's it's very common in the universities like you have to be the good one if you if you cannot achieve things because you are not self-managing uh, you are not good in this you have to be more okay and the same happened with violence if he, if this prophet is this teacher is looking at you in this way maybe you have to look how you you dress maybe you smile too much maybe you so it's something that is continuously going back revictimizing the people that have already received violence another thing is obviously uh, families activists have to be empowered instead of uh, mm, being uh, criticized and in this sense we I, we bring i bring a few example uh, from Catalonia and from Mexico, because we have been doing a research uh, in between the two countries. For example, um, there is this um, a male feminist box where students can denounce anonymously what happened to them and then they make it public. Okay. Um, this, this, this was a very interesting experience because obviously many women that were not uh, many students that were not able to denounce in the through the official path were able to make it uh, know their experience uh, through a less official path okay and the other thing is that obviously um when you receive a uh, gender violence you really need support it's very difficult to leave it uh, alone so this group of peers can be really strong to help uh, each other. And also here we have a more um, external action. So they take the Congress in the states of Puebla in order to, as I was saying before, in Mexico, violence is very strong, but also students uh, and, and family students are very powerful. So they have say no very strongly and they have arrived to occupy the, the Congress in order to um to make their voice hearing and then another thing is the politics of networking we are uh, uh sometimes uh, uh to uh, use it to understand the university as uh, something isolated the institution in itself and we don't have to we are not having too much contact as institution at least i don't mean the single person within the university but we have to move it out and say that for example there is a lot of collective within the the community that are already working on uh, 
uh, prevention and attention to sexual gender-related violence, and we have to work with them or LGTB groups and whatever, because uh, also is something that we believe is you cannot just uh, um, make a training to people that work in the university and they will understand everything because it's something that we have so interiorized that is not just a question of knowledge. So if we want to do courses, if we want to prepare people, if we want to detect, it's very important that um, experienced people, people that have specific knowledge can help us. And also because both students and, and teachers, we don't not live just in the university. So we don't not need just the support within the university. We need support in our lives. So it's uh, very important. And finally, I think this is uh, my last uh, uh, slides. Um, we have to change the paradigm, the paradigm from inclusion within this, our system to transformation. Uh, sometimes some some idea of diversity model, model sometimes uh, they they talk about valuing the difference with acceptance, tolerance, and inclusion. Uh, we talk about minority, about vulnerable people, and um, we believe that the, this word and uh, this concept can be um, dangerous. Okay, because uh, when I accept someone is uh, I'm, I'm devaluating this person because it needs my acceptation. When I tolerate someone else, uh, I just tolerate people that I don't like, people that I not agree with them. So it's a very paternalistic view of approaching differences. And the same is inclusion. You have to be included in our group. Then when we talk about minority, okay, uh, is women a minority? Or is racial people, racialized people a minority? What does we refer? We are talking about minoritized people because we are the one that are doing the action of transform them in a minority. And the same, people are vulnerable. Uh, I don't know how to say in English, but vulnerable, vulnerabilized. <laughs> so we we are is not that people are vulnerable in itself for its characteristic that is part of his identity but is the process that we are doing that taking from them the possibility of uh, putting in practice this, their agency so uh in conclusion i believe that uh, what uh, we we have if we really want to tackle gender related violence within the university we have also to include a transformative approach of our way of understanding knowledge and institution. And uh, I'll finish here. Thank you very much. Sorry if I take too much time. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for, for um, guiding us through this, um, through this uh, flow of ideas and um, finishing with the big, you know, that big goal, which is, you know, it's, it's not a small endeavor, system transformation, but um, as you uh, very, very uh, sort of aptly showed us that uh, it is basically what needs to be done. All these uh, vocabulary of diversity, as you said, tolerance, inclusion, acceptance, has agency with a ma majority, with an assumed majority. I accept you, so it's a, that implies a hierarchy of power, because I have the power to grant you acceptance, yeah, to grant you inclusion. I include you into my circles, not you include me. So there's always an us and them, and there's a majority and a minority. This is basically the model that is uh, that it's based upon and it's very it's very important to draw attention to this and um also that uh, with these vocabulary we you know we, we shape our world we shape our university because these are the key words that we you know that we throw around uh, everywhere at the moment so there's um there's a lot to talk about absolutely <laughs> and thank you yes thank you very much um I would uh, I would like to Dirk, if I may um, um, uh, I would like to stress uh, one um, one point um, uh, and, and kind of uh, go again go back to last week where the this idea of meritocracy has also played a big role. So you know, you, you you can do it if you really want to. You can because 
I mean, you have no visible marker of difference. Uh, we're all the same here at this institution. Everybody is allowed to go to university. In Austria, we don't pay fees, uh, so uh, there is no uh, socioeconomic barrier. Everybody is allowed and everybody can succeed. You know, and, and there's the, that's this narrative of meritocracy, which is, of course, so much uh, at, the, at the very bottom, at the root of neoliberalism. Um, at the same time, we are an institution where we do foster and a uh, 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 few people. We don't have everybody at our universities. We don't, but, but we have a part of our part of society at our universities. So this is why I think this is such a big issue at the university, and we need to talk about this a lot. How can we actually implement it? How can we deal with this remaining a university, which is in a way an elite institution? But do it differently. And, uh, and I also want to add one, one last point in, in this. And I think it, it, uh, it fits very nicely with, uh, I think it was the slide, the, the seventh um, you had there, the, the chain, um, or, the, or the sixth, the politics of networking. Um, what this idea of neoliberalism does to a, a university is also that it has the effect of individualizing. And by individualizing, you, um, you don't foster groups. You need groups to do politics, though. So it's kind of a depoliticizing university. This is a, sort of one of the processes I think we can observe, and that's um, that's a very dangerous one because you know we need <laughs> we we need politics, we need groups, uh, activism needs groups. But this idea of a neoliberal university and the idea of meritocracy focuses on the individual and doesn't foster an atmosphere of, of politics. Um, there's lots more to talk about, and uh, I'm, I'm sure Dirk has some some comments. And then I'm then I would also ask uh, Christian if there are any comments in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much, Barbara. I mean, that was really fascinating, and, and especially at the very end, right? I mean, uh, system transformation. I mean, um, what system are we actually talking about, right? Is it only the system of the university, or? Uh, or is it uh, much, much more? Because um, actually, what, what what might be needed is a is a transformation of uh, society as a whole and university as a part of it, of course, right? Which and, and because all these things are reflected in each other, and so um, so I was wondering if you could tell us maybe a little bit more about um, so to say the setting you're working in, right? I mean. You, as a researcher, you are, you know, you know, you are situated in the department of um, pedagogy, trained as a psychologist. Um, you're doing this research. How is this? Um, how does that relate to um, to institutions inside the university, or you know, institutional settings you have uh, that? Um, that take care of these topics and issues and they take care of, for example, gender-related um, violence or or questions of, uh, of diversity and so on. I mean, that might be particularly interesting because, you know, we here in this setting um, are um, faculty uh, colleagues, but also students and also um, people working uh, at the university at, as administrators and so on. So we have the whole university here. Um, I mean, could be. Um, and, um, and of course, also in the Aurora setting, I guess we are very much interested in this question, you know, how can we make an institutional change, right? This transformation you're talking about. So, and then especially in a university where you have all these expertise on these issues, like uh, with people like you. Uh, so how is that reflected in, or the brought back uh, to the institution and to an institutional setting um, in the university? Um, do you want me to answer now, or do you want to make... No, go ahead, go ahead, go okay. ahead. Um, okay, I, I would like to mention a little bit things about what uh, Silke, I, I like both your comments and I found it the more, more interesting. 
you were talking about that uh, we have to recognize that we are an elite institution, but uh, yes, but we may not be an elite institution. My my ideal, it will be that university will not be an elite institution. So um, I I don't think I I'm. I'm uh, I really don't think that everybody have to go to the university because university should be for people that want to go to the university. And we have to um, evaluate much more the secondary education. And there is people that have done just secondary education and that they are brilliant, intelligent and wonderful people that they can, they can have a fantastic life. At, it, it didn't mean that because you pass through the university, you are better or you know more. You know differently. That's the things. So I, I, I believe that in my ideal university um, will be um, much more diverse, much more heterogeneous, but with people that will like to study in the university, that will like to make some um, more reflection uh, even theoretically or um, and not just to achieve a title for having a specific uh, uh, opportunity, working opportunity. I think that the, the, this is a problem of the university. So I will consider it not, I will love that will become not an elitarian place, but where people that independently on the uh, possibility, economical possibility, they can have a grant and they can participate if they like to. So how does we um, transfer the system and how is the setting? This is a very, very big uh, question. I agree that uh, we don't have just to transform university, but also society. Uh, that's that's for sure. But uh, um, as a feminist, I think that uh, I'm, I'm used to work uh, even in much more micro transformation. So, for example, uh, starting with the relation with our PhD students or students trying to transform it and um, making visible that other form of doing are possible. That it didn't mean that you don't make mistake. And for example, power relations are always there. Uh, if someone say, oh, I have a very egalitarian uh, uh, group and there is no power relation is probably someone that is denying power because we all have power. We, 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 we use our power. We can try to work it differently. And for example, it's something that from a family's point of view, we are uh, reflecting on how, which is the difficulty we have with this how we want to have a different uh, way of managing relation within, for example, a research group, uh, but we have no exact clue on how to do it and uh, record, a knowledge and responsibility at the same time. Having so, so we are in a try model, okay? So uh, in relation with the, um, with the setting, I think that one of the problem of our university is that uh, uh, there is too much bureaucratic war work at too much sectorization. For example, with the USV React, we make uh, um, uh, courses for teachers, students, and the administrative people together, because we believe that uh, gender-related violence uh, need to be worked uh, uh, also through ages, through position, and uh, we, if we wanted to make it uh, a real change, is not uh, making teacher against administrative or students against teaching because this is this is not going to work. The real change did everybody to work, and uh, uh, for example, uh, it worked very well, but we have a lot of difficulty in doing it. The um, the dean of the university and the uh, sorry the how you call it the rector the chief of the university uh, in our university was a, was agreeing with us. They like the idea, but, you know, there is all this bureaucracy and uh, courses for teacher organized by this section, courses for administrative organized by this section, courses for students organized by this one, and uh, they have to agree with, the, with each other, and they have different uh, system in the computer to make, uh, to describe yourself. So 
the bureaucracy became the big problem in order to do something uh, that was transforming. So I think that one of the problems we have is that uh, even if we want to change things, sometimes it seems that the structure have to be maintained because obviously the chief university cannot subscribe herself and the students <laughs> because they have to delegate to other people. But um, um, that's require more flexibility from all the part and it's not always the case. Um, another of the problem is that in, in the courses, for example, they were not mandatory and I agree that they are not in some point, but it happened that the people that came, most of the people that came were people already sensibilized with the topic. It didn't mean that there were there were any change because obviously they learn more. They uh, we give them uh, contacts, uh, resource, and whatever. So I'm sure that they have been have an effect, but it's difficult. Um, at the same time, for example, for the work we have been doing, we have been invited in many universities here in Catalonia to uh, some uh, to doing section with the uh, when they were defining the new policy of the university uh, to criticize their policy, to analyze them. So we participate in different things. Not we didn't decide what they have to do, but uh, we give them suggestions. So it was a small way to try to to change and to learn from each other. And also we create a quite um, interconnected group of people from different universities that work together on this topic and they can we can we support each other when we can. Um, so about expertise, I think that one of the things is also that we don't use the expertise within the university in a in a very collaborative way. Um, departments are just uh, normally are like a, 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 a intended that if there were the where between the departments, I want the discourse for me, this is mine, this is mine, like if you were not just one body, <laughs> okay, that work together. So, and, and sometimes um, there is things that you, did. why don't we have, for example, uh, within uh, the social worker department and the psychology department and whatever we can create, with the teachers, some of the support unit, and also make students uh, work on it uh, as a practice. Uh, so we have expertise that are not getting used uh, for giving response of the needing of the university. And uh, when it happened that uh, they they get used is mostly because uh, people do voluntary work. So a part of your teaching, a part of your researching, a part of your bureaucracy, on the top of all this, you also put your activism, so you work at 24 hour a day. So it's like a very strange things in also if we think we want to revert the idea of neoliberal system, but then we become uh, involved in our side in reproducing it. And uh, that is, is a bit scary in some point. Um, so I don't know if I answer about your question about setting, but if if you will. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. Uh, there is also there are quite a few questions in the right. chat now, and uh, one of them goes back to uh, what you just talked about, and maybe we can you can expand on it a little more. But I'm going to read them um, from the top. Uh, Evert Grohl asks: um, Within higher education, what do you think the role of religion, Christianity, Islam, is as an incentive for gender-related violence? Uh, you want me to up uh, one on one? Okay. Yeah. Let's do. yeah. Okay. Um, I think that uh, I, I I am mas myself an, an atheist, so uh, I'm not a big fan of religion. And I think that religion are an institution in itself, and there are uh, most religion, at least the, all the one that I know, are heteropatriarchal <laughs> anyhow. So they they obviously they they are another element of cultural uh, cultural element that can uh, support um, the culture of uh, difference uh, between gender, the dichotomy between gender, and uh, and whatever. 
Um, if there are specific incentives within the university, I work in public university. I think that, that this be can become a strongly in a private university and uh, in private university at a religious university. In re in, I don't see that uh, they are, at least in here, a key element in this sense. Nonetheless, we also, uh, religion is part of our culture. So, for example, I have a Christian background. Uh, I don't define myself as Christian, but I have a Christian divine. And we know about culpability, for example, is something that we, we bring on us, even if we try not to. So is is part of our culture. And in this sense, is an important element. But uh, I will not focus on them specifically unless we are in a specific space where uh, there is a religious university. I don't know if, uh, but if this person have a different experience, please tell us. There is another question from the audience, from Anita Konrad. Uh, thank you for the very interesting lecture. Could you give some examples for the institutional policies and their limitations and shortcomings that you've mentioned? Yes. Um, yes, for example, um, what uh, at least here, okay, that is what I know more, okay. Uh, um, we have uh, a two set of policy and one is the equality policy of the university and the other is the protocol against sexual and gender related violence okay sometimes it's just one protocol sometimes are two sometimes are three sometimes are divided by um for example in my university is divided if you are students from students or uh it involve a teacher or administrative and can be involved with a student too, but uh, is a different one. Um, or sometimes, for example, there is specific LGTBE protocol and uh, um, more violence against women protocol. Um, but uh, the, for me, the, the big diff, the big problem, uh, the first big problem is that there is this equality plan and the protocol after they were two sets apart. Um, you cannot really uh, work, uh, produce a change if uh, we don't do a, an integrate politics within the university. Um, then it seems that there is something that to become really, that in order to denounce, it seems that there to be something big. Okay, so we don't uh, tackle all the, this small violence that are going on. For example, one of the typical things is that uh, we all know those professors that every two here have a new student lover. Okay? And it's not violence because they are adult. Okay? But what does it mean that every two here, every three here, you have a new student level? How you, how power is is entering in this in this relation? Okay, and uh, why are we not? Is, it didn't mean that university have to do um, something against this person, but why we are not talking about it? Why we don't talk about, uh, for example, uh, in a in a meeting a few days ago, they told me in a, in a in a university in a foreign university where using a policy in which they allow relation between, uh, for example, um, a teacher and a PhD students. They don't enter in this, but you cannot be the uh, uh, PhD supervisor anymore because uh, things can happen. It's not you are two adults, it's happened. That's not a problem, but you cannot be their supervisor because the power relation is going to be strong and it can um, make a, a bad favor to, to the to and can produce violence. Okay, so um, or for example, uh, what we do with a, a pro a teacher that uh, make LGTB comments in the classroom. Okay, there there is a big a, a, a difficulty because when you when you protocolize it, it seems that okay you can do as small things you can. Uh, 
make you can say okay for one month you are not going to give this classroom anymore but is not uh, is not changing the, the system and the situation so i think that this is one of the uh, big limitation another one is that the progress is very very strong uh, that uh, for example teacher here um, many of them have um, they are state uh, um, officer so uh, their working position it's very difficult to move so they you have really to prove that they have been doing something extremely ugly to without any possibility to have them uh, for example not teaching anymore okay but uh, this is, is difficult to happen so what's happened sometimes is that for example they we have cases in which they a, pe a person that have been harassing uh, three uh, PhD students and uh, subordinate teacher uh, for years. He have a two year of uh, paid not working time. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that's like a story. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and, and uh, if I can, um, if I may, um, uh, of course, we have another sort of uh, complication that uh, in, in, in theory, we have a freedom on in research and in teaching. So I remember there was a case going through the press about a, a philosophy professor in the UK. I forgot, I forgot which university, but she was uh, kind of questioning um, uh, transsexual uh, uh, identity because she said, you, know, you have one gender and it's assigned to you by birth and that's it. And it, my philosophy is, is that. And so she was, uh, she was attacked for that. But she says, this is, this is my philosophical point of view. So I'm, uh, I'm free to teach. Uh, about this and uh, and of course that's that kind of adds another layer and we all I mean, we would all defend the freedom of our thoughts and, our, and of our teaching and so that's i think it, it adds a uh, complication to that but we have other questions from the chat so sorry for cutting in um let me take this by shiva swift um that in discussions um there uh, there's a one a very often cited statistic is that says that only three percent of rape accusations are wrong do you know more about these studies and do you what do you think about the number uh we have a number here not about rape um, i don't have this great number on this but we normally use in, in here in spain we use uh, a calculation that is being made by the Ministry of uh, Defense, no, of, uh, it's not Defense, um, okay, the, the one that take care of uh, penalty, now you know now the name of the Ministry, the Fis La Fiscalia, that I don't know exactly, but anyhow, is an official number that they say that uh, um, in relation with the law, of uh, gender-related violence we have here in Spain, uh, the statistics say that 0.03% are false, okay? So, um, and I don't have the data of, uh, of rape, but uh, I think that uh, is much more the case, uh, are much more the case of rape that are not being denounced that uh, uh, the one that are false uh, denounced. Uh, a problem is that sometimes people that uh, are against the gender ideology, uh, they state that uh, if there is not enough proof to prove the rape or the violence, it means that it was not a rape of the violence, but that's false. The fact that uh, someone is there is not proof, it didn't mean that was a false violence denounce. That is a, something different, and the cases are really, really low. Uh, shall we take up the next question, Silke? So there's a question by Helena Wolf, uh, and it actually goes not to you, Barbara, but to Silke and myself. Uh, it's about the, um, the situation at the University of Innsbruck. Is there actually an independent contact point for victims of sexualized violence at the University of Innsbruck? So this would be um, 
der, der Arbeitskreis für Gleichbehandlungsfragen, as we call it in, uh, in German, das so-called AKG. Um, and that's, that's the point at the university. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's so good. It's mm -hmm. a, independent institution, so to say, in, inside the body of the uh, university. Um, and, uh, and you can contact them uh, with all, uh, you, know, when for, you know, when it comes to forms of discrimination, uh, but also uh, when it comes to forms of uh, sexual harassment or, or violence. So that's the, mm. um, I think we cannot share the link here because nobody can see it. But it's the Arbeitskreis für Gleichbehandlung. Yeah, but I think when the, the, the when I read the question uh, correctly, uh, uh, Helene Wolf, um, it's about the independence, isn't it? I mean, uh, obviously the Arbeits the, the anti discrimination or, or the equality uh, um, uh, uh, referendum there is uh, it's not an independent. Uh, position. It's uh, we would. Uh, I don't think from a student point of view. I mean, um, this is this is also. I think it's it, it's really uh, really important to to see the perspective of the people who are you know uh, who who need or who need the help in in this. And um, um, I don't know about the UH sort of the, the student body. They might offer uh, also a, a contact people, but. Um, to have a, a bureau, an office within the institution, um, but actually it's, it's located not in in the very, in the main building. So you have to go into the main building. You pass all these, you know, you, you walk the great halls. You pass all these great doors, and then until you come to this, I think the barriers are pretty high that you reach the person to talk. And I, and they, and we will we will have them here in this lecture series, and they they do fantastic work, absolutely. And I would, um, from knowing them, I would. You know, I would <laughs> definitely vouch for them for being independent. But I think the way to this person for a, I don't know, 20 year old student is a long way. So I, I, if I if I get it right, uh, I think that's that's kind of the way that where you're coming from. That's of course, that's right. But they have uh, a specific status. So they are uh, um, so, uh, I mean, of course, you're right with, with all what you say, but indeed they have a very specific status in terms of being an independent entity inside. Of course, it's, of course they're inside the university, that's true, uh, but they have a very specific status, uh, otherwise they couldn't deal with all these um, issues professionally. Here, for example, there is not this such such a thing as an, an entity with specific status, and we are thinking to we, we are one of the requests we are doing of our ch central government it is to have one outside the university and from all for all the university, so mm -hmm. that um, is not just uh, from depending on the university, but depending on. Uh, independent, completely independent, and from all the university can converge there. But the problem is that anyhow, if, even if uh, students don't feel comfortable to denounce, the things is that less, uh, that it seems that teacher and the administrative st staff are the one that denounce less. That's, uh, that's a, big, a big deal, I think. And also, I mean, you were talking about subcontractors, uh, and people, I mean that that is that they would um, they would not find their way there. And I mean, I remember uh, uh, saying uh, a, a colleague of us, uh, Dirk, you you know who I mean, Nikita Davan, who pointed out that you know the real internationality of any university actually happens after six o'clock at night and before six o'clock in the morning when you know the cleaning staff is in. So, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a part of our university which is um, completely kind of below the visibility barrier. I mean, they, they of course, I mean, they're, they're a vivid part of this, they're part of the system, but I don't know uh, who their spokesperson would be. Probably the contractor, and not sure if that's a good spokesperson, but uh, that's, uh, that's another problem. But just just to share this information, because Barbara talked about it, this this idea apparently in your region to set something up, right? I mean, there is of course also the Studentenombudsman in Vienna, in Austria, right? So there is something like a 
another i mean independent it's part of the federal ministry but it's uh, it's also a um a, a place where you can go to so to say and um uh, with all what these specific for university Terrier? specific Sorry, what? for university it's for it's it's to, for all universities in austria okay. it's it's a it's a point where students can can send their in their complaints right so and they will take care of that so that's that's also another level uh in the austrian system that's relevant for all austrian uh, higher education institutions i may have to make an interview to you some point <laughs> to explain me more and give me some link uh, <laughs> but but i would I actually i i would have another question because i think you mentioned these uh, Okay, sorry. No, no, you, you go ahead. You, you go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned these courses and um, and you said uh, something like, you know, these courses are sometimes like preaching to the converted or preaching to the choir, right? Because people come that are already interested in the topic. And, uh, and I think a question that is very relevant for us also here when we try to strengthen these, these issues in the Aurora network is how do we reach out to the, to the colleagues and, and, and everybody at the university uh, who currently um, doesn't think that this is a relevant topic for everybody at the university and for the whole institution, right? So how, how do we get to the other, you know, people who, who are not on our side yet, so to say? Uh, do you have um, any ideas or experiences uh, when it comes to that? Well, I mean that I, I think that um, there should be different level of courses and different kind of courses. And uh, some of them I really think that should be mandatory for all teacher and staff. Um, maybe not uh, the kind of course we prepared was a very course that start from uh, questioning yourself and uh, and um, it was a little bit uh, empowering people in order to being able to detect and uh, and uh, and act against the gender violence so maybe this is where a large course maybe is not uh, necessary that everybody will take it and maybe also it's better that if you are not already a small sensibility, you don't uh, believe that you become an expert with this course because you don't. So, um, but a smaller course with a uh, uh, few information, what you cannot do and what you have to do and whatever, I think it should be mandatory. And, um, yeah, and the sort of uh, assuming responsibility and understanding, for example, also debating on uh, what was the difference between uh, uh, free thinking and uh, free cathedra and uh, um, uh, how do you say and uh, and uh, harassing people or or saying people exclusive is being exclusive with uh, with your students and whatever. So I think mm -hmm. that's. But it's tricky, definitely. It's definitely tricky. I think okay. it goes back uh, now. I think um, we were already uh, <laughs> at the limit of our time, and I think I can include it in my maybe concluding remarks. I think it, it does all go back to the the system transformation, doesn't it? The the culture of something and uh, what i really liked barbara in, uh, is that you actually you also gave us i mean you talked about your work but you also gave us sort of a national perspective um how th things are done at your university and you kind of <laughs> stretched out to the the south of the north i think you said uh, uh, um, where denial is <laughs> at the moment this the state um whereas the anglo-saxon approach is more the screening and safety so uh, creating a, an atmosphere of controlling again that that's part of a culture of, of doing things and i'm still trying to figure out where austria and uh, innsbruck stands on this and i think it would be very interesting to see in the coming weeks where people place their institution and and the national framework of course given in politics and policies um what can be done and what cannot be done and um where they are in this kind of uh, and on this pro in this process of uh, system transformation i think that's um uh, there were great, great ideas and uh, a lot to think about also for the coming weeks. So let me conclude this session by thanking you again very, very much, Barbara. That was a very interesting lecture and, and so to the point and for, for answering all these questions uh, for us. 
Thanks again. Thank you very much, both of you. I can only join Silke in thanking Barbara. It was really a pleasure to have you. And uh, I hope we see you all um, again uh, next week uh, from Barcelona and Tarragona. Um, we go to uh, Naples, uh, Federico Secundo, our other Aurora partner universities with Francesca Scamadella and Flora Di Donato. Uh, I think they are both at the law faculty there, um, protecting vulnerable people rights as a challenge to higher education, clinical legal education as a path towards social uh, inclusion. So please join us again uh, next week. Bring your own lunch and uh, see you again. Thanks again, Barbara. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.